Hello, everyone. Hi to everyone online, everyone on the island at Kiggins Commons or in the classroom with April or wherever else you might be right now. Thank you so much for tuning in to our Rock Talk tonight. Um, in case you don't know, Rock Talks are a long-standing tradition uh, at Shoals. They are very well loved and historically faculty members and guest speakers would gather with students on Appledore Island's rocky shoreline, which gave the Rock Talk series its name, to present on a wide range of topics related to natural history, ecology, biology, and more. So after having our uh, 2021 series hybrid, thanks to COVID, we're now continuing that. So thank you for everyone showing up online. Um, and without further ado, April will introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Jim Carlton. I guess, thank you so much. I'm so pleased to introduce our Rock Talk speaker, Dr. Jim Carlton. Oh my gosh, sorry, Dr. Jim Carlton. <laughs> sorry, Jim. <laughs> It's been a long day, <laughs> um, but thank you so much for coming. I've known Jim for the past 20 years. Um, Jim has been a mentor to me over many years, and um, I know I know what I know about marine invasions because of Jim. So Jim is really like the father of uh, marine invasions research, um, has inspired so many different people to go on to work in these really important systems. Um, and so I'm really, really pleased um, to be able to um, to introduce Jim because of all this great work that he's done over the years. So just a little bit of background information. So Jim is um, Professor Emeritus of Marine Sciences at Williams College um, and Director Emeritus of the Williams College Mystic Seaport Maritime Studies Program, where he spent many years um, working with students and inspiring many careers um, in marine sciences um, over that period of time. And Jim is retired, but not really because he's still doing like so many things all over the world um, and has continued to do lots of research, um, not only in North America, but um, in many different places around the world. So you're going to be hearing a bit about some of this global reach that Jim has um, when he talks, does his talk today. Um, his research focuses on the environmental history of coastal marine ecosystems including invasions, as um, I just talked about, of non-native species and modern day extinction in the world, extinctions in the world's oceans. His research sites include the Pacific and Atlantic coasts of North America, as I mentioned. He also has done a ton of research on invasions in Hawaii, as well as the Galapagos Islands and in many other countries around the world. And so with that, I would like to turn this over to Jim um, for what is gonna be a really excellent talk. Thank you again so much for coming to give a rock talk today. Thank you very much, April. Pleasure to be here tonight. Um, and thank you all for, for, uh, for being with us for a few minutes. I'm going to talk about a, a um, phenomenon that began 11 years ago. And when we, it first uh, began, uh, we had no idea where it was going to take us or how long it would last. Uh, the start of the story takes us back to uh, 10 years ago this past March, March 11, 2011 when, as some of you will remember, there was a massive earthquake followed by a tsunami in Japan, uh, particularly northern Japan, north of Tokyo, where the wave heights were huge, reaching over 100 feet and proceeding uh, several miles inland in some cases. Uh, this was a huge impact uh, on the north coast of, um, of Honshu. Uh, nearly 20,000 people lost. Uh, it was a major undersea earthquake. Uh, uh, offshore and in the deep sea floor. Parts of the Japan moved eight feet closer to North America. The seabed rose over 16 feet. And as a result, billions of tons of seawater were displaced. These are some of the images that we saw um, immediately after the tsunami. The next day or two, uh, more than 1,000 ships were lost, uh, vessels were lost, small vessels. And but the uh, resident vessels were taken ashore. These were coastal towns, much of that debris, what's left, much of the other debris went out to sea as we'll see in a moment. But it had a huge impact on the coastal zone. You can see the scale of this, of, the, um, of what happened in actually all in a few minutes. This is a model that um, predicted um, the progression of the tsunami um, um, wave um, uh, form across the entire uh, Pacific Basin. It was correct within a few minutes uh, in uh, 
15 hours, um, or around 18 hours, sorry, it came ashore on the Galapagos Island and destroyed the marine biology lab there. Uh, it eventually came ashore in the Antarctic and loosened a large piece of an ice shelf, basin-wide effect. What it did, it generated millions of items launched into the North Pacific. Some of them were already in the water and were torn away. A lot of it was on land and was then ejected into the ocean. Everything you can imagine, look around you, look at the contents of the room, look at the campus, everything went into the ocean. From the smallest household goods, I was, I was part of a ceremony in uh, Japan that returned this child's green bucket to the family. The uh, family did survive. Uh, a huge amount of wood, which we'll talk about in, in a, a few minutes. Fisheries, fishing material, aquaculture gear, the thousand small vessels I mentioned, piers, pontoons, entire coastal forests, large ships, all sent into the Pacific Ocean. And as I said, we'll talk about the wood in just a minute. Where did it all go? A lot of it went down to the seabed. Some of it, as we saw, was still onshore or carried back to shore, and a lot went to sea. So considering those two categories, stuff that was in the water already or on land, the material in the water, the marine origin debris, already had marine life on it in large part. And what was sent into the water was then colonized by marine animals and plants if it remained resident in uh, nearshore coastal waters uh, for enough time. And then off to the Pacific Ocean. This is a complicated path. These are, these are, these are highly simplified um, arrows. Um, there are many, many subgyres. Many arrows go in the opposite direction. This is the big picture where if you leave uh, Northern Japan, in general, you're going to head for the North American continent or be turned down into the Hawaiian archipelago, for example, as you can see right around the, the second sea of the word Pacific, or be turned back to the Western Pacific. And unbeknownst to us at the time, what, what ensued became the first opportunity in the history of marine science, the history of marine biology, to track a major transoceanic rafting event, which reflected a wide variety of material, critically from an exact known origin and an exact known sea entry time, and as it turns out, a phenomenon that was going to last over multiple years. So that was March, 2011. In the spring of 2012, just about a year later, things from the tsunami began to show up in North America. A soccer ball from a high school, which was returned to the high school, showed up in Alaska, a Harley Davidson motorcycle in its crate washed ashore in British Columbia. It is now in the Harley Davidson Museum in Milwaukee. Uh, and a large vessel, a crewless vessel called the Rio One Maru came ashore um, uh, and was first spotted off Sitka, Alaska. It was, um, 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 sorry, it was first spotted off British Columbia and then ended up in Alaska. It was detected first by the Royal Canadian Air Force uh, near British Columbia, it was considered a hazard of navigation. It was watched very carefully, drifted for more than two weeks, and the Canadians were forever grateful that it drifted into Alaskan waters. Um, it became um, uh, the subject of a musical uh, piece for a bassoon quartet by a composer. The vessel was now drifting in Alaskan waters, and because um, we have large U.S. Coast Guard vessels that um, have large guns on them and cannons, but have very little use to those. The US Coast Guard vessel uh, Anacapa was deployed to sink the Rio Anmaru, which it did unceremoniously to the bottom of the sea in 6,000 feet of water. Unfortunately, prior to any biological assessments of what was on or in the vessel, presumably most of, most of what was in the vessel went to the seabed, unless there were a few things shaken loose by the, um, by the cannons. Let me take you to the port of Misawa, which is in northernmost Honshu, right below Hokkaido. Today, it is a US uh, Air Force base, uh, as well as an important fishing port uh, uh, in northern Japan. This is, um, these are the docks on a quiet day, um, uh, and four massive docks in the port. 
each of the docks, uh, 188 tons, uh, essentially unsinkable. Concrete, stainless steel, rebar, filled with pre-stressed styrofoam, a life of about 500 years. They can either be in the water or they're on land, but they can't sink by, by the nature of their design. We know that under those docks were hundreds of species of marine animals and plants, the following community. And we have a little arrow here saying, note the white ramp. I'm gonna show you the next day. This is going to be March 12th. The tsunami is on March 11. The docks are gone. On the inset, you can see that the white ramps have fallen into the water. As it turns out, the docks were taken away, not by the wave itself, by, but when the, the first wave, but when the water receded out of the harbor by their own weight, they were torn off the land and then the next wave carried them away. Where did they go? They weren't there. When people came back, these four massive docks were simply gone. They must have gone to sea. We can't see them. They have no, they have no lights on them, no, no, um, no radio trackers. Can't see them from the satellites that we have access to, um, uh, normal satellites as opposed to Defense Department satellites. And they're drifting around the Pacific, again, without lights, not something you'd want to run into in a small boat. And of course, largely at sea level. Now it's June 5th, 2012. A little over 14 months later, morning beach walkers report a large dock has floated in around uh, central Oregon, just north of Newport, Oregon. Uh, coincidentally, about five miles north of the um, Oregon State University Marine Lab. And this is what it looked like when it first washed ashore. Um, it may, had made a nearly 7,000 kilometer journey across the Pacific Ocean. How did we know this dock was from Misawa? It had a plate on it that says, I'm from the port of Misawa, built in 2008. And it turns out it was coming from the north to the south. A year later, a graduate student at Oregon State University was looking at video monitoring a, bird, a seabird colony and watched the dock float from the north to the south uh, the day before. And it came around you went ahead and landed on the beach on June 5th, where it was then discovered. Here's a little bit of a profile and scale. There's a pickup truck there and people uh, next to the dock. Again, note this, no, uh, the size of the structure. And it had aboard massive colonies, hundreds of thousands of um, mussel, also introduced to Japan, the Mediterranean mussel, middle of scalp provincialis, and a native seaweed, the Japanese kelp, Andaria pinnatifida, both of them well-known invasive species. Um, there were access ports on the dock, uh, on the top of the dock. Um, some were gone by the time of the landing, others disappeared. Curiously enough, soon after the dock came ashore, it turns out they were collected for souvenirs and they showed up on eBay uh, not long after. And, but inside the dock was the Japanese sea star Asterius amurensis, another well-known invader of Australia. Altogether, um, an impressive variety of species, uh, over uh, nearly 130 species of um, protists, invertebrates, and seaweeds representing a, a, a wide variety of phyla were on the dock. And it turns out many of them, as I mentioned, were well-known invaders and already had posters up around various parts of the world watching for these species and, uh, or looking to eradicate them. The result was that within a day or so of being um, alerted, county and state officials um, were very concerned about whether any of the species on the dock might uh, settle in Oregon. And so an eradication program immediately began scraping and scraping a little bit of fire and then burying a lot of things up on the beach, emptying those plastic bags in holes that were quickly dug in retrospect, maybe a little bit farther inland, but things were moving uh, pretty fast. Agate Beach, the small beach where the dock landed, gets about 500 visitors a year. In the summer of 2012, 25,000 people came to the beach to look at the dock. This is what they saw. And by early August, removal uh, had begun. It was cut into four massive sections at a cost of $86,000. And this is when I was able to first get out there uh, and examine the dock, which was now pretty clean. 
but there were those seaward facing bumpers, those little white things on top that had not been removed. And what we found in those bumpers were living Japanese barnacles and living mussels that were doing very fine, were very well in the surf after two months on the Oregon coast. That's a lesson that will be learned in another event that I'll show you very soon. And off the dock went into the world of disposal. But remember there were four docks. What happened to the other three? This is dock number one. I'm gonna get back to that in a little while. What happened over the next few months was that many objects began to come ashore along the Pacific coast from Alaska to California and the Hawaiian Islands. Lots of boats upside down, hydrodynamically turned over, many objects that had not been seen before. Uh, and this was a pulse that began coming in. I wanna emphasize that from the biological point of view, we were not waiting for this. We were not waiting a year or two later for these objects to arrive with species aboard. This was a phenomenon that, we, that was set on the doorstep and that we were beginning to begin to understand the, the scale of it. After the dock arrived, we didn't know if anything else would arrive with, with living Japanese species. But as those objects began to come in and as we realized there were more species, we established a network of um, contacts from Alaska to California and Hawaii. We established collection protocols, real-time communication, photography, and how to get preserved samples to cooperating laboratories, um, cooperating laboratories at OSU, um, Moss Landing, and um, the Smithsonian, and our lab here at Williams Mystic. There were quite a few challenges in 2012, 2013, and as it turns out, as the years went by in retrieving the actual tsunami objects, we were aware that items were found, recognized, but eventually never reported. We heard about them much later. Uh, the public did a pretty good job in absconding with things that were found, uh, boats in good condition. Um, we think a lot of stuff landed in very remote areas, British Columbia, Alaska, and even in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, beach cleanups were one of our great nemesis that it really well-intended but removed an awful lot of good stuff that we might have wanted to study. Another challenge was that um, when things came ashore, they were also acquired by the public in a different way. This is a vessel that was from the Awadi prefecture that arrived in Oahu as a boy that came in also from Honshu. They had living populations of mussels on them, but before state officials could get there, in both cases, they had already been barbecued uh, uh, for, um, for dinner. How do we know an object was from uh, Japan? How do we know it was not made in Japan? How do we know it came, uh, how it was related to the tsunami of March 11? That took us several years to work out very carefully. We did have the benefit of formal identification. Many of those boats had registration numbers working with the consulate of Japan. We were to track those back to that day, March 11, and lost by those owners. Things of known Japanese manufacturing, like the lumber I'll mention, Bioforensics turned out to be very important. Describe that in a moment and pulse event timing. These are all the clues that brought together whether an object was from the tsunami release. Um, the, from Japan versus made in Japan, we were able to decode. A lot of the boats had prefecture codes, Owari, Aomori, Miyagi, or Fukushima, which allowed us to track the history and origin of those vessels. Uh, here was a large um, navigation buoy, also with identification materials that we could uh, track back to on a humble port. This was found off Kauai uh, in 2013. The lumber that was coming in, a lot of it was really unique. Beach walkers who had been walking the coast um, had never seen anything like this for ever in their decades of walking. And research done by a group in British Columbia in Euclid really nailed down this lumber as typical Japanese uh, construction lumber down to the millimeter scale in a mortise and tenon joints, very distinctive. Bioforensics means that we could use the fingerprint of the, of the origin of the species to tell us where the object was from. And, and the species we were finding said that they were from the Tohoku region. 
from the biologically, from the cold temperate waters north of Tokyo up to um, uh, um, uh, Hokkaido, uh, from the Aomori, Wadi, Miyagi, and Fukushima prefectures, a very distinctive fingerprint of species uh, uh, found in that region. If objects were coming in from Southern Japan or from any other part of Asia, they would have told us that they were species not from that part of the coast. And, that, and we would expect that, but this was a fairly tight biological signature combined with pulse event timing. And this is, this is an interesting piece of history, which is that prior to 2012, there are in fact no published records along the Pacific coast. And we have data going back to the 1850s of any object landing in North America or Hawaii with these communities of living species from the Western Pacific. In contrast, here comes a very consistent pulse. This does not mean that this did not happen. This means it was vanishingly rare and it had not been recorded in the history, the biology, ecology, historical or policy literature. As the samples came in, we, had, we uh, approached these from many points of different view. We wanted to identify everything on the, on the, that was coming in that required more than 80 taxonomists from around the world. We did as much uh, sequencing as we could. We looked at population characteristics, especially of mollusks and, and crustaceans, arthropod uh, insects as well, marine insects. We looked at the chemical and growth history of mussels using a barium calcium ratio. Altogether, about 634 objects at the time that we wrapped up the first phase of this, which was February 2017 that I'll be mentioning to you. Out of what I think are thousands of objects that came ashore. Um, uh, minimally uh, along the entire coast. Overall, nearly 400 species alive arrived in vertebrates, two species of fish and seaweed. Uh, a little bit of uh, overview here, um, um, about 35% of the, about one third of the species uh, were already across the Pacific, were, were amphi-Pacific, uh, presumably their natural distribution. That's a default we use. Uh, some of them have been introduced prior to that with uh, various human mediated mechanisms. Uh, about 85% of the taxa are right there with the mollusks, the worms, hydroids, uh, sea anemones, bryozoans, and crustaceans. Um, as of February 2017, when we wrapped up the first data set after five years, nearly five years of study, um, the cumulative species richness had not yet leveled off, um, it was still climbing. Uh, and as you'll see very soon, things still came in, but that was the data set that we closed off with for the science paper that came out um, in September of that year. And importantly, with those 600 and some objects, it was really a minimal estimate because nearly 50%, um, uh, uh, more than 50% of all the taxa were detected only once, which means that nearly every other few objects that came in gave us another species. Not surprisingly, um, richness declined um, over, over time. Um, uh, really, uh, objects coming in were, were uh, species rich uh, in the first couple of years, began falling off um, after a few years uh, because of whatever events were happening as, as these objects transited the Pacific Ocean for as the years went by. And interestingly enough, we could tell a little bit about where those objects were, again, using the species aboard. As the objects drifted south, some of them went into southern Japan, some of them as far down into the, into the South China Sea. And what happened was that here were the, some of the cold water species that were on these objects when they began, and settling on top of those were warm water species that told us that the track of some of this debris had taken a little bit turn down to the south, picked up some warmer biota before being re-engaged by the Kuroshio current and moving back to the um, east and north. Another way for us to track where the objects had been were that as they went to sea, they acquired different species of, of uh, pelagic organisms, neustonic organisms that live in the surface of the water, um, that are native to the open oceans. In the North Pacific, 
bryozoan that lives on the high seas on debris and wood uh, and so on is uh, called Jellyella tuberculata, but it has a congener just down in warmer water. It's called Jellyella ebernia. So when a vessel showed up in Washington with Jellyella ebernia, it told us that that vessel had taken a, a steep dip into, into lower latitudes before being turned back up and heading back up to North America. And another clue was um, how some of these species were when they arrived. Um, if you transit through uh, the Pacific Ocean, you might pass through high productivity waters in the high latitudes. The Central Pacific can be usually much lower productivity. And what we found was that the Middle East Gallup Provincialis, the mussels that were landing in Hawaii had far less gametic development than those arriving in the Pacific Northwest. This is the Saishu Maru an Abalonian sea urchin fishing boat. Um, uh, we interviewed the owner um, of the vessel from a Wadi prefecture, IT, as you can see. Most vessels turned upside down as they came across. The Saishu Maru managed to cross the entire Pacific right side up. And there's a wet well in the back for the Abalonian sea urchins after you collect them. Um, there were a tide pool had formed covered with seaweeds, when, when people arrived and looked at the boat, there were Japanese fish in the tide pool. Um, and this is the um, bar and knife jaw, Oplagnathus, uh, various common names, which then um, survived um, um, uh, until 2016 in a local aquarium in Oregon, um, wondering where its friends were. There were five of them in the boat, four of them went on to um, scientific immortality, and this one went into an aquarium for a while. Three, um, four years later, in April 2015, another vessel, half of a 50 foot long vessel was spotted drifting off the central Oregon coast. There are the uh, wells inside and inside with a yellow tail amberjack from the Western Pacific. This is a species group that occurs both in the Eastern and Western Pacific. They look almost identical. These, uh, we sequenced them out and turned out to be from the Western Pacific. Knife jaws were also in here, and many of these fish went to the Oregon Coast Aquarium. Knife jaws were also found free living, curiously enough, <clears throat> excuse me, in Oregon and in Monterey Bay. And we assume what happened was that, that the debris that they were in, the small boats or whatever they were in, broke up as, as they came ashore, releasing the knife jaws previous to the tsunami. Um, with well over 100 years of fish observations, no Japanese knife jaw had ever been seen in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. The Monterey Bay um, uh, knife jaw was about a year old, found. Another knife jaw was found um, much larger, over a foot long in Malibu of all places, where it was spearfished for dinner. We did get the um, ear bones, the otoliths, the Monterey Bay uh, uh, individual was tracked very carefully. Local divers were told not to bother it, and it was tracked um, for another five years um, uh, and seen up until a couple of years ago, uh, still in Monterey, where it had grown from about six inches long to uh, over a foot long. What about those other docks? Remember the first dock came ashore in June, 2012. This is now September, 2012 off of Maui. And this dock appeared drifting from the east to the west past the Hawaiian Islands. It was found by a fishing boat. And that's a crew member walking on the boat. I talked to the captain of this boat. The fishing vessel hung around the dock for a few, couple days fishing off 5,000 pounds of mahi-mahi before they told anybody and they turned the video over to a Hawaiian TV station. That's when we first heard about it. And there was a big effort to find the dock after um, the fishing boat was done with it. Um, the captain reported there was a lot of seaweed on the side, but that's all we know. It was then tracked uh, as it went um, uh, past uh, Maui and then over to Molokai. Uh, models show that it either crossed over Oahu or drifted right in front of Pearl Harbor. A lot of effort was made to search for it, boats and planes. Either way, it was never seen again and off it went. It's now December 2012. 
and a fishing vessel um, reports um, a large dock at night floating off of Washington with a quote, extensive marine gro growth. We hear about this within a few hours because of our contacts in the US Coast Guard and a massive search is launched to try to find this thing. We know this is Misawa number three because of the morphology, the configuration of the dock down to the spacing of the holes on those bumpers. And it was found. Five days later, we're looking out of a US Coast Guard helicopter um, as it was found washed ashore in a seriously inaccessible part of the Olympic National Park where there's no hiking and really no access in midwinter. This is not the dock that went past Hawaii 11 weeks earlier. You can't be sailing toward the um, west in Hawaii and make it all the way back, back around um, uh, to Washington in that period of time. So several days later, um, it was accessed by a field team. About half the number of species uh, that were on Misawa 1 that landed in June in Oregon were found on it. Many alive, many, all, these are all the live ones and many reproductive, and then a massive effort to remove it because you can't leave a large piece of debris like that in a, um, um, in a uh, national uh, park. And there was a big effort to get everything off of it, including cleaning off the bumpers, as we learned from the first one. And here we are cutting it up. And there's a nice YouTube video, which you can watch sped up with a helicopter, then removing all these pieces for a cost of over half a million dollars. So here's the story. Four docks left Misawa at the same moment. Misawa one comes in June. Misawa three follows it six months later to the same general area of the Pacific Northwest. Misawa two drifts past the Hawaiian Islands and Misawa four has never been seen. Three of the docks were seen, two recovered and two, it's been 11 years. Um, could they still be floating around out there? Yes. Could they have come ashore in a remote area? Possibly. We do keep the red bat phone handy in case the phone rings and we keep our passports around just to see if we could possibly still find it 11 years later and examine it. But for the purposes of tracking an object launched from the same place at the same time, this is one of the challenges describing apparently four very different histories. What happened after that? In the spring of 2017, after the February data set was closed, more things began to arrive. And curiously enough, a lot of sea anemones began to arrive, uh, more so than in the previous um, studies. In the spring and summer of 2018, more species began to arrive on tsunami debris. Again, a signature of the Tohoku coast, the tsunami coast north of Tokyo. And by 2018, these coastal species have been seven years at sea, a half decade longer than any previously known maximum length of survival of coastal species. And then two years ago, May 2020, nine years and two months after the tsunami, another tsunami vessel washed ashore with a host of living Japanese species. And here's the interesting part about these species. They were all characterized by direct development or asexual reproduction. Even the little mussel was a brooder, which means this was essentially a floating island that was self-replenishing, a self-sustaining community. As long as the island lasts, these species were recruiting to the island and drifting out there for nearly a decade. What they're feeding on, of course, is not known to us. <clears throat> so what we have is both multi-year growth, aging, limpets that were coming in, we think are over 10 years old, um, and including some limpets that we found this past spring, aging out, perhaps, and then self-recruitment. But the overall picture after a decade was that we were, we were strikingly limited in our understanding of the physiology and the ecology of these coastal species to survive out on the open ocean for so long. If we think of this conceptually as a model, a broad descriptive model of how you get from 
there to here, we can break it up into a series of stages. We can think of the launch um, uh, from the Western Pacific, what happens um, as objects might acquire species and co-rafting in the near shore, what happens as it acquires additional biota before we leave the Western Pacific, then there is the transit across where things can die. You could reproduce as we just saw. You could acquire eustonic species like Jellyella and the gooseneck barnacle lepus. Um, you could co-raft with other things and acquire from uh, species from other things you bump into. And of course, when you're out there, there's predation and competition as well. And then you've made it across to the Eastern Pacific. You could also be colonized by Eastern Pacific species at this time. There could be loss. You could have survived the entire trip and die on arrival. You could land on a beach, as most of this stuff did, and simply desiccate and die. You could also arrive in these nearshore, more productive waters if you cross through the Central Pacific and undergo some rejuvenation into higher productivity waters. The question is, can we populate this model with some of this tsunami data after a decade? Another way to another way conceive of this is to overlay what's called the, the invasion process model on those steps. So there's entrainment, what's called vector acquisition. There's transport. And then a series of events happen after arrival. The inoculation is the release of the species. Some of those survive, some may reproduce, some may establish, and some may spread, in theory, in ever decreasing numbers. Between the inoculation and the establishment, there can be lag time between the actual successful introduction and the detection of a species. That of course gets us to the question, which is that after 10 years or so, 11 years now, and all these hundreds of species that have come in, do we have any reports of successful invasions? And it's an excellent question. And here are some of the challenges. The time lag that we just mentioned. It can be years, many years sometimes, before we can actually detect an established population. <coughs> Excuse me. Critically, we have no formal surveys in place. It's very difficult to get funding for something like this just to go out and look for species. Right now, we're relying on other, other surveys that are out there, some of our own for other reasons. And citizen scientists, which have become a huge part of keeping our, our um, eyes uh, on the coastal zone. And perhaps almost equally critical is that many of these species require expert identification. Sponges, hydroids, polychaetes, copepods, amphipods, bryophilamentous algae, a host of species for which in some of those groups, there are no professional taxonomists on the entire Pacific coast. That anemone that came in was very distinctive. We recognized it as a member of the genus Anthopleura. There's a bunch of Anthopleuras in Asia, in the Western Pacific. This was very much unlike any of them known from North America. Several different names, a little complex taxonomy. And in 2018, which I think is not a coincidence, an Anthopleura never seen before began appearing in the rocky intertidal of Southern California. It looks awfully much the same and is now becoming very abundant. And we're trying to compare these anemones genetically to see if in fact they are the same. In 2019, with NASA funding, we launched another aspect of this work which is rather than wait for things to come ashore, we thought it might be a good idea to go out there and see what's floating around in the ocean um, right now. In the um, um, Eastern North Pacific, that would be um, a gyre, which is popularly known in part as the garbage patch. And this is a multi-institutional effort with lots of participants from University of Washington and Scripps, University of Hawaii, Smithsonian, uh, and a lot of NGO participants what's happening out there in the Eastern Gyre. And so we had a lot of cooperation 
from um, citizen scientists, NGOs who are out there collecting debris to get it out of the ocean. And this includes the Ocean Voyage Institute, OVI, Ocean Cleanup, Vortex Swim, Greenpeace. And so we were able to get our hands on some of that debris that was being retrieved by NGO voyages. And what we remarkably found was that on some of that debris, not tsunami debris, and not debris from coastal sources, because things like these large fishing nets are lost on the high seas, there were coastal species that had settled. Hydroids, our little friend, the anemone, and sponges, polychaetes, and other species. And we began to realize that between this and the material that we were seeing after a decade that was still floating around out there, the coastal species were in fact surviving very well in the open ocean. And so um, uh, last December, we published a, a short note describing this, this uh, establishment of coastal species on the high seas in what we call the neopelagic community. And the neopelagic community is a combination of the native species that are out there, barnacles and bryozoans, living together now with coastal species that apparently, um, uh, as far as we can tell, had no seriously available substrate out there until we began introducing a vast amount of plastic into the ocean. And it's suggesting that it might have been habitat limitation and not as we presumed for a few hundred years, physiology that restricted these species from, from living on the high seas. A little cartoon that was in the paper showing this mixture of pelagic and coastal species. The question that came up early on and over the past 10 years is how does this anthropogenic rafting, how does plastic rafting differ from what we know as natural rafting for millions of years? And natural rafting, historic rafting, would be trees and branches and root masses, seaweeds, coconuts, which would be out there. Modern rafting adds that anthropogenic material. And one interesting observation that came out of the work on the tsunami debris was that the wood fraction, remember all that wood from Japan, a huge amount of it drifting across the Pacific, including Japanese trees that we identified and being ripped off the forest and coming ashore in North America, largely gone in about three years. We think most, much of it was likely consumed by shipworms, not only shipworms from the coastal zone of Asia, but the oceanic shipworms that live just in wood drifting on the high seas. And that meant that when the wood fraction was gone, what was left was largely a non-biodegradable uh, fraction of long lasting plastics, which would then seem to likely seriously change the picture of how long you can live out there and how far you can go. Another question that came up is, why 2011? What, what, what about before 2011? What about historic tsunamis in Japan? Why didn't we see this before? Turns out there's a pretty good record and if we, if we restrict that record just to the area of the 2011 tsunami, we can go back to the year 869 with roughly similar tsunamis of magnitude, presumptive wave height, all the way up to 1933. We're not going to get a lot of information prior to 1933 from the record. So we can look at the 1933 tsunami and ask what was there? on that part of the coast that would have donated a large amount of material into the Pacific that would have taken it then out to North America and the Hawaiian Islands. What was the scale of coastal infrastructure? And it turns out we have some photographs. In 1933, the airfield, now a US Air Force base, was just the gravel runway. And this is what the towns were like, what was left of them made of wood. And it turns out there was no plastic. Fiberglass comes in 1936, styrofoam in 1940s, but that's just when they were invented. 
in reality, plastics become something very much at the last part of the 20th century. And we know that from this increasing awareness of the amount of plastic material that is out there. Now, a series of papers become, uh, started coming out in the last decade, trying to describe the amount of material that was out there and the scale of it. Here's a paper from uh, now seven years ago, noting that nearly 200 coastal countries generate plastic waste. And that was, that was from seven years ago. This is Miami Beach in 1925. This is Miami Beach in 2017, same shot. And the effect is concentrating more plastics on the coastal zone, probably than ever before, as these large cities continue to develop in the coastal system. And we also know something else is happening. We also know that with climate change, cyclonic intensity, monsoons, hurricanes, um, typhoons are increasing. And that, and that in, in pulse and in number and in strength, the future is likely a greater cyclonic intensity. And that leads us to this consideration that there is a linkage, often not, not really brought together. When we start with the history of the plastic industry, which is a recent history and now fundamentally pervasive, look around you, and the history of coastal development and urbanization where siting and developing megacities on the coastal margins at a scale unprecedented in the 20th century and going into the 21st century. And with those shifts in uses concentrates, as we just mentioned, a huge amount of plastic at the land sea interface at a time when there's a greater and greater probability of that material being washed into the ocean. And with that sweeping of things into the ocean, potentially colonized by marine life, giving us an altered picture of not only our ability to actually alter the high seas that we thought was one of the last untouched places, but also a scale of biogeographic change and invasion potential. that's really kind of hard for us to wrap ourselves around. And I'll leave you with this thought, which is that the people who work in these silos, the people who know about the plastic history, the people who work on coastal development, people who work on climate change, and the people who work on invasions, often don't talk together very much. And there has never been a time when folks representing all these silos have ever been in one room together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jim. That was really awesome. Um, if anybody online has a question, please put it in the Q&A and anybody in Kiggins or with April can ask the question right into the computer. So go ahead. Hi, April. Any questions? From anyone? I'll turn the light. Happy to talk about things past, present, or future with this phenomenon. We, we have a question in, in our room here. Oh, has anybody written an environmental history of this event? Oh, has anybody written an environmental history of this event? Or is that, is that going to be something you're going to do, Jim? <laughs> um, you know, it's a, it's a good question. It's, a, it's really an ongoing phenomenon. Um, we, we picked up a little bit of stuff coming in this past spring, 2022. We know we, we're to the tip of the iceberg of understanding what's out there in the open ocean, which apparently has been seeded by coastal species. And while our concentration is in the North Pacific, this generates a huge number of questions about what's going on in other ocean basins, South Pacific, North Atlantic, South Atlantic. So no, not yet. We haven't, um, we haven't written up a really synthetic history of this. We've been getting a series of papers out on the biology, the ecology, um, uh, quantitative aspects and experimental aspects of this, but, 
But uh, starting with it, with that, we never expected uh, to study this and all the way to, we never expected to still be studying this. It's really a, a, a fascinating thing. And I think it would bear certainly um, the eyes of a number of other folks outside pure marine ecology to look at the scale of this phenomenon. We have a question online. Um, it's from Willow. She says, I know you mentioned you don't know what the organisms were eating, but do you have any ideas about what they possibly could have been consuming to survive that long? Yeah, next question. No, um, um, you know, we started to do some stable isotope, isotope studies um, and that, that's where some of this is gonna have to go. But it turns out there, there is, there, there, there's food out there, obviously, because there are um, huge numbers of gooseneck barnacles, lepus. Some of those guys are 12, 15 inches long. There's a lot of bryozoans out there eating micro, microscopic level particulate material, um, uh, protists and bacteria, perhaps. <clears throat> we just did not know that coastal species were gonna be able to tap into that because they did not evolve there. So um, uh, there is a phytoplankton and a zooplankton fraction out there the extent to which um, uh, dissolved organic material is contributing to that, uh, uh, amino acids, things that you can absorb as well. And, and where that is out there is that we know that the productivity is very patchy out there. Um, so uh, the trophic aspects of this are really probably one of the most important pathways to figure out. They are surviving out there, they're reproducing out there, and obviously we have seriously mistaken our interpretation of why coastal species um, were out there. And again, we think now it was because of possibly habitat limitation. Willow says, thank you. Amy has a question for you, Amy Fowler. Do you wanna come up, Amy? Amy. Amy's gonna come up and ask the question. Hi, Amy. She's coming. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jim. Hey. Um, I have a question about the neoplagic communities. So how long do you think that those had actually been there? Um, because plastics have been around before the tsunami event. So is it possible that that neoplagic community existed before the tsunami event? And how long do you think that's actually been going on? I'd be curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, we have very little historical information uh, to tap back into, um, you know, uh, vanishingly few samples from even uh, the early 2000s or 1990s. It's tempting to think that it was the tsunami event that seeded the North Pacific Ocean. When you send out this huge wave of, of a Western Pacific biota into the Pacific and coincidentally, there was a lot of habitat there already, not just the stuff that came out, but in fact, we had already put in a floating plastic hard environment out there. Was that ready to be seeded um, or were there some precedents? Um, we know that before the tsunami, there were um, Asian species floating around out there. We have that from um, sailors, from photographs, nothing in the scientific literature. Um, we know that some species came ashore prior to 2011, vanishingly rare, not from the scientific literature, as I mentioned, but uh, I didn't have time to get into it. But we did a lot of work with beachcombers. And some of those folks have been walking those beaches for 50 years. And we got a couple of people in the Pacific Northwest who collect all that stuff. And we found that some of them had collected occasionally a buoy, 24 inches in diameter with large live pink Asian barnacles that came in. And they kept it because it was the one thing they'd found in 30 years. So that's that rare event, never entering the scientific literature. So it's possible, we know things were drifting over in the past, but we don't have any good ideas to when some of this seeding began of coastal species in the floating plastic environment that's out there. It's a good question. That floating plastic has been out there for a number of decades, as it turns out. This is not, not new. 
the scale of it is probably new. Um, and that's an interesting thing we can talk about, along with all these massive efforts to get the stuff out of the ocean, which is a little frustrating because it might be coming in as fast as we're taking it out. That was a long non-answer, sorry. <laughs> Carrie also has a question if there isn't another, is there another question in the, Carrie. from you, I, Anna? I, I do have one, yes. Okay. Do you come Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, for mass NGO like cleanup projects, do you, that market just getting trash out of the oceans? Do you think there's value in them saving the the debris to study where it came from, or do you just want it recycled? Like, what should the priority be? Yeah. Um, um, uh, that in fact, in fact, um, things like the ocean cleanup uh, um, was one of our sources. Of that material, um, they don't have a lot of time or bandwidth to save stuff for us because they're just involved in trying to get hundreds of tons of stuff out, get it on the boat, and then figure out what to do with it um, once they get it on the boat. But we have relationships with some of those folks. Those are ongoing. Um, even now as we speak, we have folks out there who are going to keep stuff for us. We've given them small freezers. We've given them jugs of, of, of alcohol and things like that to try to preserve some stuff for us. Uh, and, and they're the ones who are out there. Um, there are not many research cruises out there that, um, and the larger vessels that are out there would need a dip net, you know, that's 50 feet long. So um, uh, th that's our source of a lot of material, we hope in the future, um, as long as those efforts continue. Um, those efforts do face a wave of pushback because of the concern that as much as you take out, it seems like it just keeps going in. And it's kind of the analogy is um, you wouldn't attempt to clean up a room um, of all the insects and leaves forever until someone points out that maybe you should close the windows. And so, um, uh, but it's a challenge and there are folks out there who are very dedicated to trying to extract a lot of plastic and figuring out a way to do it cheaply and efficiently and in, in quantity. Yeah, so we'd love to see that stuff in the same way we like to see things that beachcombers find. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Let's see the question from Carrie. Carrie, Carrie. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, two questions, one of them's really short. Has anybody looked in the North Atlantic or the Atlantic to see if there's stuff in that gyre and that plastic? Yeah, um, there's some work going on in the Sargasso Sea. Not, not high latitudes, but a little bit lower down in the Sargasso Sea um, um, as to what's going on in there. I haven't seen that work uh, myself, but I know that there's some folks doing that. In the higher North Atlantic, not so much, no. Um, and you don't have to go far. You know, it'd um, be interesting to see what's floating around the middle of the Gulf of Maine. Mm -hmm. That'd be kind of cool because we got a little gyre there and we know that stuff comes off of Maine and it bobs around out in the gyre there, including some of the nicest fucus you'll ever see in the world. <laughs> it's living in the middle of the Gulf of Maine and where it never, and the water never goes away. So the intertidal fucus is growing out there and takes a whole different form and shape in a really luxurious habitat. Anyway, that's a little bit of a sidebar, sorry. Second question was whether the, um, I'm trying to get my head around the scale of what's going on in the patches that you've looked at. So is, is this like a new stepping stone or is this, you know, it's still kind of figuring itself out in terms of the population sizes and ability to act as a source itself? Yeah, we don't know. Um, uh, the model is that there could be a bridge of plastic from uh, Asia to North America, a uh, conveyor belt, um, but the dynamics of population replenishment, you know, we've got this one boat that came in two years ago, which apparently had been doing very well until it landed and was replenishing itself for over a decade. Um, it is um, very unlikely that that's the only boat that's out there doing that. And so, in fact, 
those kinds of floating islands could be centers of propagule dispersal. Little floating islands moving around now in the garbage patch and outside the gyre that are doing very well and can be Johnny clam seeding the ocean. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. April, I don't think we have any more in here. Do you have any more over there? Any other questions in our room? <laughs> Carrie. Yeah, Carrie wants to ask another one. But <laughs> I guess we are at nine o'clock. So <laughs> oh, we're good. We're good. Carrie. Oh, we really have me. Okay. Okay. Yes, She's good. coming in one more. Sorry. It's just a follow-up. <laughs> yes. A follow-up. It seemed like there's a tension between the species that are able to make it across on the boats and self-sustain in these little local recruitment dynamics versus the things that you would expect to act as, you know, I don't know, seeding other passing by stuff. So I wondered whether the stuff that's out there that's not coming in on the boats is stuff that has more of a broadcast spawning life history or has most of the stuff had local recruitment? Yeah, I mean, that is a central question. You know, if you put out planktotrophic larvae, are you a goner out there? Because um, uh, uh, what are your chances of finding a place to settle if in fact you have a lifespan in the water of, of a few days, a few weeks, um, a barnacle larva, six weeks? Um, one could argue that the probability uh, is increasing all the time because uh, the chance of bumping into a piece of plastic might be better now than ever before. So there's that. Um, but no, we know very little about, about uh, those that have planktonic larvae uh, because those do disperse away and where they go. So there could be mussels out there that are living and doing very well and limpets, but where their larvae go and if they successfully recruit, we don't know yet. Um, one interesting thing, and I'll, I can end with this, is that we don't have a lot of recent population genetics on some of these guys. And that'd be totally cool to look at some of the haplotype patterns of things bouncing around out there, what's coming ashore and things like that. So there's a few dozen PhD pieces floating around out there. Thank you very much, guys. I won't keep you any longer. Thank you so much, Jim. It was really great of you to take the time and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, everybody in the audience, thank you so much for attending. And next week we will have another rock talk, same time, same place. And it will be by Anna Davidson. And I'll tell you just a quick little bit about it. She'll lead you on her winding path in art and science to work in ecological art today. She will share her experiences as an artist at sea in the Arctic and at the Lost City Hydrothermal Events on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge while showing her interdisciplinary work in sculpture and video. So that promises to be very interesting. We hope to see you guys all there. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>